Hi, I'm Dr. Jim Shaw with California Southern University, and today we're going to spend a few minutes talking about how to write your doctoral dissertation. What are the elements that necessarily have to be in your doctoral dissertation project? Let's start with chapter one. What is chapter one about? Your overview of your study. What is it in terms of a big picture that you plan to do? Why is this important to you? Think about it psychologically. What is the, psychological, what is the psychology that drove your interest in this project? I've had students who have a little bit of a difficult time explaining what the project means to them. But when I tell them, well, what's the psychological temperature, if you will, that you experience? And they suddenly get it. Oh, so just analyze your own psychology as the driver of your interest in this project. And then let me know in writing, why is it important to you? Background of the problem. One student said, well, what do you mean by background of the problem? Well, think of back in terms of reverse chronology. What is the back of the chronology of events that got the problem to this point that interested you? Why are you interested in it? Then tell me or tell your readers about the background. What is it that's supporting your interest in that project? What is it that makes you curious to the point that you're willing to drop everything and research that project. That's part of the background that I need to know about. Statement of the problem. Background of the problem and statement of the problem are not the same thing. You're giving me a big global, if you will, picture of the background of the problem. What are the supporting events or the supporting historical chronology that makes it a problem? Now I'm asking you to narrow all that down and give me a succinct statement of the problem, your words. What is it that makes it a problem that I should care about? Why should I care? Why should other readers care? If it's a national kind of problem that affects ethnicities, that affects economy, that affects the psychology of going to school, that affects the psychology, for example, of being arrested, then why is it a big problem? So we're coming from background of the problem and we're moving to the statement of the problems. So we're moving from the general to the specific, kind of like deductive reasoning, if you will, deductive to inductive reasoning. Purpose of the study. What's the reason you chose the study? Articulate for me why you chose the study. Why is it important to you? It could be a number of things. Maybe you're in the profession that needs the contribution that you're hoping to make from doing this study. Maybe the field or the research project idea is overlooked or not paid enough attention by literature, by other experts and authors. What is it that is compelling you to move forward with this study? Again, think of your psychology. What is the psychological climate? If you will, give yourself a checkup from the neck up. Where are you psychologically that interested you in this project? And not only interested you in the project, but has really kind of, you know, we often hear the statement, ideas, I don't have ideas, ideas have me. Well, what is the idea that grabbed you and won't let you go and that's just moving you along day to day until you get more clarity on the project you get other people interested in the project, and most important, you find literature sources about the project. So where are you with that? Purpose of the study is where you will now will state your research questions. Some students feel that interest in the project is enough to move them forward, and they therefore find it slightly difficult to carve out a number of questions that provide the framework and basically legitimate their interests. So what we're asking you to do is what are, define your research questions. Questions are what drives you forward. Questions are what interest you. Questions have to be answered. So what are the five or six or seven questions that 
drove your interest in this project? Those are the research questions. What are the, and think of it this way, what are the answers that you're hoping to provide to the questions? Where are the holes that, in your opinion, are extant in the literature that's out there or in the practices, the professional practices that are ongoing? Where are the voids, in your opinion? What does the literature say about that? See, those are all fodder, if you will, for questions, legitimate research questions. Now state the importance of the study. Who are the stakeholders? And when you think of stakeholders, I like to think of it this way. In Old English, there were landowners who actually staked claim to their land or, and it wasn't always land that was property. Property had multiple meanings. It could be land, it could be, uh, you know, a vassal servant, it could be part of the serfdom, it could be a horse, livestock, that kind of thing. Often they staked it with their coat of arms, their family coat of arms. In old Europe, a coat of arms told a lot of stories, generational studies, stories as a matter of fact. You could see the rise and fortune of the family or the neighborhood just from reading their coat, reading their whole coat of arms. That was their stake, that was their claim to fame. So who are the stakeholders in your project? If you are, for example, doing a project on adolescents who commit homicide and murder before they were age 16, who are the stakeholders? Who's going to benefit from that information? And who might change from that information? In fact, who are the potential stakeholders? Because often in research, when you, and I know it's happened to me, when I investigate a community, for a number of years as I did when I went inside the California youth prisons for four years to interview girls and boys who committed murder and homicide before they attained the age of 16. There were stakeholders that emerged later that I didn't know about. I did not know police departments would be interested in my research. I did not know, I knew psychologists would be and sociologists and teachers would be, but I did not know parent advocates would be interested in my research. So stakeholders certainly are probably the ones who are obviously there, who occupy positions, who have something to gain or benefit from by virtue of your research. But there's probably a future field, if you will, of stakeholders who at the very least would be interested in your research and at the most might even use it, purchase it, quote you, cite you as their, their source, get a grant with you participating in the funding to conduct studies or clinical approaches, that kind of thing. So identify the stakeholders and how they might benefit from the study. And I emphasize the word might because often when we do research, I think it's a natural human tendency to use words like uh, shall and will, or at least think them, shall and will. Um, I dare say, as a researcher, I, I, who's Jim Shell? I, I have no power. So my language should probably be in the subjunctive. They may use it. They might benefit from it. I would hope that if I can convincingly and clearly show the voids that I perceive in this, that they may share my, my feelings or share my decision about this, that kind of, you know, however you want to put it. I think the, the more clinical we can be in our language, and in fact, I was talking to students last week about this. I said, you know, you write well, but it's almost like you're, you're telling a story to a classroom of elementary students. I need you to read a lot of dissertations and get the tone and the style of the language. Not necessarily to, to mimic it, but to adapt it, to get your other ear, your linguistic ear, in shape and in pitch and in tune. And she did that, did 10 dissertations so far. And she said it's really changed her language. She's thinking more clinically, and she's able to write more clinically. Limitations and delimitations of your study. Very, very important. Suppose you're doing a study on human sex trafficking. And one of the entities you're researching in terms of data is the police department in Orange. But Orange wants you to go through a lot of bureaucratic hoops. And you're losing time. 
And you don't get a discount in, your, in terms of tuition in your dissertation semester. You still pay the same, whether it's half a unit. There's some universities have half a unit, like Paramount, one unit. You still pay the same kind of thing. So you run out of time. You're also running out of money. I don't know which is more important to you. The limitation of getting your data is clearly up on you. It's, it's a clear limitation. Write about that in your chapter, what the limitation is. That, and you, it's not to make excuses, but it is to make a citation or a disclosure, if you will, that this research was the, limited by not having full and complete access to records in the custody of the Orange Police Department kind of thing. The other side of that is that with limitations, there are delimitations. What was it you did in spite of that? Well, you looked elsewhere for answers rather than use that particular data set that you were hoping would have been supported by the Orange Police Department and might have if they hadn't had these abundant forms for you to security clearances. And this is, that's an actual case, by the way, security clearances. What did you do to go around that? What did you do to circumvent that so that you still got the data that you needed? And if the data is generalizable, verifiable, and reliable, then it conforms to those elements of good research. So let us know the limitation, things that impacted you, may have confined you, may have restricted you, but what did you do to go around those clear and present limitations to get the answers and the data that you needed? In your chapter one, there's definitions of terms. Present those in alphabetical order, define them, and please use APA format. APA format you'll find will be your friend, and I like to advise students to use it early and use it often. Don't wait until the last minute, which I consider just before your dissertation defense, to start using APA format. Really use it early and often. Organization of your study, detail, discuss excuse me, how your dissertation will be organized. I think probably it's recommended that you look at other published dissertations to see how they organize theirs. Do they start with data first? Probably not. Do they start with statement of the problem? Probably so. Do they start with the history and chronology of the event? Probably in a limited way. But one caveat, if you give us too much history and chronology, that puts you in either the educational camp, writing an educational tome, or a sociological tome. We're a school of psychology. We don't give degrees or doctorate degrees in education or in sociology. We give doctorate degrees in psychology. So keep that in mind. Am I giving my mentor too much history and chronology. Occasionally, probably a little bit more than occasionally, occasionally our, our students are doing that. And even if you have 95 pages of the history of juvenile crime in a southern state, which I won't identify, as one of my, men, my, one of my learners did, stop and turn around and go back the, the other way, the right way. If you're going down the wrong way for 95 miles, in a one-way direction, and you find enlightenment and in truth at the 95th mile, gee, turn around and go the, the other way. The student, I have not heard that she's done that yet. She, instead, she told me, but I spent so much time doing this. And I said, and you've, and you've written it very well, except it is all sociology. You've given me data. You've given me events. You've given me juvenile court information. You've, you've given me all kinds of epiphenomenology, but you haven't given me the why of it. The why is what I, as a psychologist, need to hear. That's what I live for, not the what. The what, I can tell you, behavioralistically. But again, we don't offer degrees in sociology, so you need to give me the why so that I can clearly see through the filter of psychology that your history and chronology, one, is truncated. It should probably be no more than five pages. And then you get into the psychology. Why is this occurring? 
and you use the psychodynamic terms to show me, a psychology professor, what I need to hear from you. And more important, to show me your understanding of the psychological effects of it or the psychological event or why it even matters in terms of psychology. Why is it psychology? What is the stuff that you're giving me in this 100 page, 110 page tome that is psychology, regardless of the events that support the statement of the problem, the, the background? Sure, you're gonna have to have a minimum of you know, historic, history and chronology, technical stuff, as I tell students, but don't give me 100 pages of technical stuff. That puts it totally in a different camp. Well, we're at the end of chapter one. Just want to remind you, we have the checklist for chapter one, very important. You've got to know where you're going. You don't want to miss anything. A checklist is, is a tool to use. Then we have the outline for chapter one. More important, we have a template that you'll find quite useful with chapter one. So feel free to use these as tools and feel free to ask questions because research is as much a questioning behavioral act as it is finding the answers. We like to think at Cal Southern that you don't find the answers unless you have the questions that drive you forward. And I am quoting Dr. Linda Fisher in that abundantly. She has mentioned that. Let's discuss briefly chapter two, literature review. What and why? What is a literature review? Literature review basically is a composite of experts who have written in the field in which or toward which you're casting your research light. Now, I have to say, have to ask you, as I've asked other students, is it research you're conducting or is it me-search? Me-search is Jim Shaw's idea that this topic is so important. I know the entire world, not just my educational community or professional community is gonna be enthralled with this, but the entire world. It may be Nobel Prize worthy. Well, that's me search if you don't have abundant citations. Research is where you have abundant citations. Think of it as a party, because I've had students, but I can only find five articles on this topic, Dr. Shaw. And then I mentioned Google Scholar, scholargoogle.com kind of thing. Think of it this way, and then you, you, you have Students, there, there's possible or potential extremes, and I can't find enough. Two, why do I need, if, if, if this is common knowledge, why do I need to have so much research to support it? Think of it as this. You have an idea, but you need a party of folks to join you and support that idea. And they've given you permission to quote them. Okay, That's why you need secondary sources. Secondary sources are a party of other people who've come to your party and who allow you to quote them. So you should have three to four, maybe even as many as five literature citations per page. It's the literature that makes you the expert, the aspiring expert. You're the expert in the making kind of thing. It isn't just you. Again, that's just me search. That's just opinion. Research is validated with secondary literature sources and citations. Now, talking about your literature sources in chapter two, it is fully okay, and I'm answering a couple of questions, I know. It's fully okay to use the sources that your secondary sources have used. So look at their bibliographies and find who are they citing. And that will probably double, might even triple, the number of sources that you've got. So don't just look at secondary sources who are just homed on that particular thing. For example, dialectical behaviorism therapy or dialectical behavioristic therapy. There is a body of sources that are containing their searchlights, so to speak, on youth but are not really doing adolescence or pre-adolescence, and that, that's a fact. So I told the student what you need to do is look at their citations. Oh, I can do that? Is that okay? I, certainly it's okay. I mean, they're citing, they, they're going through the same process that you're going through. I mean, this has been doing, going on for a long time, this kind of research where you're citing and then citing and then citing that. So she did that over one weekend and she found abundant. So she now, I think uh, Saturday, she told me she's up to 80 
And I think you said 65 to 90 is what you want in for a five chapter dissertation. And she's, she's up to eight. Previously, it was you know kind of a tug of war for her to find enough. So that's chapter two. Let's talk about introducing the topic. What will you present and why? Again, this goes back to purpose. Part of the chapter one's uh, purpose which I should have said earlier, is to mirror or foreshadow information in chapter two. So chapter one is to reflect, if you will, just like a mirror, is to reflect what chapter two will have. So if it sounds as though it's repetitious, it is repetitious in the sense that in chapter two, you also have to have a why are you doing this? Why is this important? What you will present and why? Because now chapter two gets into the behavior. Chapter one is where you're setting the stage. You're give, presenting the concept. You haven't taken action yet. Chapter two, now you've rolled your sleeves up, you're taking action, and you're giving us the legitimacy of the behavior that you, why am I presenting this? I'm presenting this because, and then you cite the data, if the data is important to the discussion of why you're presenting it. I'm presenting this because it seems to have been overlooked. Or I'm presenting this because most of the research concerns, and this is what I did with mine, males committing homicide before age 16. Very little of the research at that time concerned females. So one was a limitation, you limited it by adding a different gender to the gender that most had already written about. Theoretical conceptual framework. Introduce the theoretical conception. Now, how do you think of theory and concepts? Theory basically is something that is not proven. Good idea, good information, but has not yet been proven. Not that it doesn't deserve any proving, it's just one of those things that hasn't been proven yet. It's logical, it's legitimate, and to the extent that you can find secondary sources to support your theory, then the evidence that you're showing your reader then becomes legitimate. So think of theory as something that is not, doesn't have to be proved. Conceptual framework. Every, it's writing is almost, writing is almost like a house. You're, you're building a house. So it's almost like a movable feast. Then the house is moving with you. The house is your conceptual framework. You are stocking the house with the furniture of your language. Chapter one has furniture. Chapter two has furniture. Chapter three has got its furniture. And that is the furniture that then comprises the concept. Chapter two, just like chapter one had, chapter two, just to remind you, we'll have a template for you to use as your quick and ready and effective tool We'll have an outline to use, and we'll also have the checklist. The checklist is all important, so remember chapter two just as chapter one. We'll have your checklist, your template, and the outline. Chapter three, let's talk about what chapter three has and why it's useful to you, why you need. Chapter three is your methodology chapter. What is the method or what are the methods are, that you'll be using to support your research and to convince me clear and convincingly that this is legitimate research, one, and two, the problem that you encountered is really a problem. So what method are you gonna be doing to do that, using to do that? Population sample, are you gonna be using population? How much of the population? Is it gonna be uh, focused on age or an age range? Is it gonna be focused or limited to gender? Is it gonna be limited to city? Could it be an urban population versus a suburban population? Could it, could it be limited in terms of careers? Could it, would it be professional population versus population that only attended high school? That's up to you to decide in terms of your population and sample. We often get the question, how large should my sample be? I don't have a quick and ready answer for that. I can't say, well, five or 10. I can tell you that PFJ 
use two. They were his own children, and that's why he was roundly criticized worldwide. But he was so brilliant about what he extrapolated from their behaviors, and he was able to apply it and make it have worldwide relevance. That is so unique. It's as unique as it is rare. I don't think anybody else has done that since. So rather than following Piaget's example, you might want to strive for not two, but <laughs> 20. 20 might be good, 10, 12. Remember, it's a theoretical or qualitative dissertation. We're not requiring you to do quantitative dissertation where you sift and sort a lot of math, statistics, standard deviations. So think qualitative or theoretical. Keep the number, probably 20 is certainly good if you can do that in a reasonable amount of time and test your hypothesis, your findings, and your conclusions. You also probably need or benefit from information. Uh, information, instrumentation. So instrumentation starts getting into the tools for testing your hypothesis. How many questions you might have. Are you going to be using a Likert type scale or a Likert scale itself? Are you going to be using self-reports if it's a qualitative information or ethnographic study and you're actually going to the population that experienced the thing that is the backbone of your hypothesis? Are you going to have self-reports, what they experience? Are you going to divide those into ages? Maybe you all 13-year-olds or all 18-year-olds or all females, or males, all males, or males who went out for sports at a certain time, or females who went out for sports or extracurricular activities. How are you gonna aggregate that or organize that information? That's all part of your instrumentation. Data collection is a part of that in terms of the kind and quality of information that you're gonna get. Often the information particularly in research that is personal research in terms of attitudes and behaviors, may require informed consent forms or may require the presence or participation of an IRB person or panel internal review or an investigative review uh, board. Very important to comply with what the IRB suggests that you use for protection of you, the researcher, for the confidentiality of the respondent or the potential respondent to make sure that their rights are observed, particularly the shield of confidentiality, make sure you understand how that works. And to, this, to the extent of explaining and walking them through the informed consent so that it's truly informed consent and not uninformed, decent or dissent. Data analysis. When you collect data, who's going to analyze your data? Are you going to analyze it or are you going to have a professional analyze it? And what is the purpose of the analysis? What are you going to use the analysis for? To support the hypothesis, to support your findings and conclusions? Probably yes to all of the above. Have a second pair of eyes. And the, um, thank you, the methods in terms of the methods book, explain the methods you're using for the data. Why is the data important to the particular methods you're using? But that begs the question, make sure the methods themselves are informed, okay? Down to certain language, certain cultures, for example, that if you're, if you're doing ethnographic interviewing, there are certain cultures that don't like certain words to be used. So you would basically leave those words out of your method, your interviewing method. Work with people to find out, technically speaking, is this a good method to get the information or the data that I need? For example, some students feel they can get a lot of information uh, over the telephone. The telephone is good in some respects. In other respects, it isn't. Um, some people feel that they should pay their respondents. That raises flags with me. When you pay someone to answer, that compromises, in my opinion, the, the worth of your study because they, of course, they're going to answer the way they feel you want them to answer kind of thing. 
Chapter 3, as chapters 1 and 2, has the three tools that we talked about. The checklist, the outline, and the template. One thing I want to reiterate is that consistency gives you balance throughout your dissertation, and there's got to be balance. In fact, in reading it, your readers unconsciously will be looking for balance. They may not know it but at the cognitive level, but unconsciously they'll be looking for that balance. The way to keep it balanced is to remember that each piece of the dissertation relates to the other. Chapter one foreshadows chapter two. Chapter two has elements that mirror chapter three. So make sure you're really looking at your outline and you're using those templates and you're using the checklist so that at each stage, and by stage I mean each of the chapters, should dovetail neatly into the next chapter. And then when we get to the final chapter, we breathe that sigh of not relief, but wow, this is a good dissertation. It feels, it feels right. It has the right weight in terms of literacy and the right balance in terms of volume. Yeah.